all right guys what's up welcome back hope you're having a good day um, this is iTech 360 I am Jeremy Ramanachan and today we will be talking about orange book controls and as you know most of my information will be taken from the CISSP prep guide so if you have that please make sure to follow along now let's get right into it okay so first off what is the orange book well the orange book is one of the national security agency's rainbow series of books on evaluating trusted computer systems this actually is the main book in the rainbow series and defines the trusted computer system evaluation criteria or tcsec and the tcsec outlines hierarchical degrees of security with the letter d being the least secure through a for the most secure the orange book also identifies assurance requirements for secure computer operations applied to ensure that a trusted computing base's security policy has been correctly employed and that the system security features have effectively implemented that policy. Now, in the Orange Book, it defines two types of assurance, operational assurance and life cycle assurance. Now, operational assurance focuses on the basic features and architecture of a system while the lifestyle assurance focuses on the controls and standards that are necessary for building and maintaining a system here's an example an example of the operational system or the operational assurance would be a feature that separates a security sensitive code from a user code in a system's memory as per the operational assurance there are requirements specified in the orange book which are system architecture system integrity covert channel analysis trusted facility management and trusted recovery whereas the life cycle assurance requirements specified in the orange book are security testing design specification and testing configuration management and trusted distribution and so with that being said we first need to talk about covert channel analysis a covert channel is an information path that is not normally used for communication within a system. Therefore, it is not protected by the system's normal security mechanisms. Covert channels are a secret way to convey information to another person or program. So it's basically like a like a trap door, a back a back door that no one's supposed to know about, but is not guarded by anything. It has no protection, no security to see that if something goes in that you would know about it or you could fend it off. There are two types of covert channels. Covert storage channels which convey information by changing a system's stored data and covert timing channels which convey information by altering the performance of or modifying the timing of a system resource in some measurable way. Covert storage channeling this is a system feature and it enables one system entity to signal information to another entity by directly or indirectly writing a storage location that is again later directly or indirectly read by the second entity and it usually involves a finite resource such as the sectors on a disk that is separated by two subjects at a different security level. And here's an example of covert storage channels, which is as simple as just changing the characteristics of a file. And covert timing channel, which is also a system feature, which enables one system entity to signal information to another by modulating its, its own use of a system resource in such a way to affect system response time observed by the second entity. Timing channels often work by taking advantage of some kind of system clock or timing device in a system and uh, its information is conveyed by using elements such as the elapsed time required to perform an operation or even the amount of CPU time expended. Just want to throw this in here, noise and traffic generation are effective ways to combat the use of covert channels if needed. So next up we have to talk about uh, trusted facility management 
and this is defined as the assignment of a specific individual to administer the security related functions of a system and although trusted facility management is an assurance requirement only for higher secure systems well of class b2 b3 and a1 um, many systems evaluated at lower security levels are structured to try to meet this requirement so it's, it's all it's like an all-round thing uh, trusted facility management is closely related to the concept of the least privilege and it is also related to the administrative concept of separation of duties and need to know and so i mentioned classes b2 b3 and a1 in the b2 class the system must protect against covert storage channels it must perform a covert channel analysis for all covert storage channels and the system requires that it must support separate operator and system administrator roles and in the classes b3 and a1 the system must protect against both covert storage and covert timing channels it must perform a covert channel analysis for both types and the system requires that it must clearly identify the functions of the security administrator to perform the security related functions so the concept of least privilege or as it's known the principle of least privilege requires that in a particular abstraction layer of a computing environment every module must be able to access only the information and resources that are necessary for its legitimate purpose this means giving a user account or process only those privileges which are essential to perform its intended function for example a user account for the sole purpose of creating backups right does not need to install software so it only has the rights to run backup and backup related applications any other privileges such as installing new software <laughs> are blocked as i said earlier trusted facility management is related to the administrative concept of separation of duties and need to know separation of duties or SOD which is also known as the segregation of duties assigns parts of tasks to different personnel thus if no single person has total control of the system security mechanisms the theory is that no single person can completely compromise this the system this concept is related to the principle of least privilege and in this context the least privilege means that a system's users should have the lowest level of rights and privileges necessary to perform their work and should only have them for the shortest length of time so basically it's the concept of having more than one person required to complete a task and in the business world the separation by sharing of more than one individual in one single task is an internal control intended to prevent fraud and error and need to know simply is that one should only have access to what they need and nothing more and this brings us into the rotation of duties which is another variation on the separation of duties and it is defined as the process of limiting the amount of time that an operator is assigned to perform a security related task before being moved to a different task with a different security classification this control lessens the opportunity for collision between operators for fraudulent purposes so the rotation of duties states basically that job assignments should be changed periodically so that it is more difficult for users to collaborate to exercise complete control of a transaction and sabotage it for fraudulent purposes now on to trusted recovery a system failure is a serious security risk because the security controls might be overridden when the system is not functioning properly and trusted recovery ensures that security is not breached when a system crash or other system failure which is also known as discontinuity occurs it must ensure that the system is restarted without compromising its required protection scheme and that it can recover and roll back without being compromised after the failure trusted recovery is designed to prevent this type of corruption in the event of such a system failure it's required for B3 level and A1 level systems and allows the system to be restarted without disrupting its required protection levels. Two processes are involved in trusted recovery, preparing for system failure and recovering from system failure. 
preparing for system failure entails running regular backups of all essential data. This preparation must allow full data recovery in a protected and orderly manner while protecting the continued security of the system. These procedures might also be required in the case of a system problem, such as a missing resource, an inconsistent database, or any kind of compromise is detected, or if the system needs to be halted and rebooted. On the other hand, now system recovery procedures depend upon a system's requirements, and system recovery procedures include the following. Firstly, rebooting the system into a single user mode, which is an operating system loaded without the security front end activated so that no other user access is enabled at this time. Secondly, recovering all file systems that were active at the time of the system failure. Thirdly, restoring any missing or damaged files and databases from the most recent backups. Fourthly, recovering the required security characteristics such as file security labels and fifthly, checking security critical files such as the system password file. And after all these steps have been performed and the system's data cannot be compromised, operators can then access the system. And there are actually three recovery types, manual recovery, automated recovery and automated recovery without undue loss. With manual recovery, the system administrator intervention is required to return the system to a secure state after a crash. Automated recovery, as you could already tell, is recovery to a secure state where it's being done automatically or without the intervention of the administrator. And automated recovery without undue loss is similar to automated recovery. This type of recovery is considered a higher level of recovery defining prevention against the undue loss of protected objects. Okay guys, thank you so much for watching. Please like and subscribe. Comment in the comment section below. I'll catch you in the next one.